I really appreciate the Grace and Worship team for such a oh.
All right, so it's at 6 o'clock, and we invite everybody to come out and uh, really support. It is a church event. All right, let us stand for the reading of God's Word. Restoring the power of the New Testament church. And if you were, if you were in Bible study uh, for the past five Wednesday nights, this will be quite familiar to you. The summary of this sermon is the New Testament church operated in power, not weakness. So many congregations are failing, weak, troubled, and dying because they are operated out of human power and not out of the power of God. Father, we give you thanks for your presence with us. And we pray that as we continue to look into your word, as you wait on your Holy Spirit this morning, and we just pray, O oh God, that you will be glorified and your Spirit will be a witness with us that he is present among us. Thank you, O oh God, for your word and for teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We read, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place all together in one place. You see, folks, without unity, you can't get some power here. Amen. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were what? Filled. Yeah. They were what? Filled. Yeah. Okay, filled. <laughs> and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit as the Spirit gave them utterance, not what they learned in education. The Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. Father, we thank you for your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So there was this woman. And it's a true story. She was driving along the highway. She ran out of gas. Holy. She doesn't know anything about her own car. So she calls her favorite mechanic, and he comes up. He examines everything. He turns on the car, and no, it just started, and it's shut off. He said, lady, you have no gas. You have no gas in the car. So the lady turns to him. He said, listen, man, will it do anything to my car if I drive it home right now? Poor thing. Poor thing. You got to look at her in amazement. You have no gas. You can't go anywhere. You stay right here till you get gas. We're going to come back to that point later on in message. Many, many Christians, and I tell you many Christians, yeah. are confused about the Holy Spirit. Yes. First of all, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. Yeah. God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. Yes. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they are three in one. When you talk about the triune God, you sing the song, Holy, 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 God in three persons, Blessed Trinity. Yes. When you talk about the Holy Spirit, you can otherwise say the Spirit of God. Yes. When a person has the Holy Spirit, is filled of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, that person has the Spirit of God. That person has the Spirit of Jesus. Some people overemphasize the Holy Spirit. Some people underemphasize the Holy Spirit. Some people ignore the Holy Spirit altogether. And so we ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit? I don't want to say what is. Who is the Holy Spirit? Because he's a person. The Bible refers to the Holy Spirit in different ways. Number one. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. Yes. And read about that in Genesis 41 verse 36. It is said of young Joseph that he had the Spirit of God. Yes. That means young Joseph in the Old Testament times, he had the Spirit of God. He was godly. Yes. He operated, he had the qualities and the mind of the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, the spirit of judgment and of fire. Listen, Isaiah was talking to his people. He said, listen, the spirit of judgment and of fire can purify you. 
And here the, the, that spirit can be, can perform the, 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 the process of purification yes. in the heart of mankind. Amen. Thirdly, there's a spirit of wisdom and understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about in John 14. Yes. John 14 verse, um, John 14 and 16. The spirit of wisdom yes. and understanding. Fourthly, the spirit of, of the sovereign Lord with anointing power. The spirit of truth about teaching. If you want to teach the word of God, you must listen to the spirit of truth. Yes. You can't go there and teach a lie on what is not in the word of God. The spirit of Christ, which teaches humility. Yes. The spirit of grace. We read about the counselor, the comforter. When we are down, when we are burdened, the spirit of comfort. And number nine, the power of the Most High. Yes. Listen, man, this is a this is a power. This is a great resume for the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Holy Spirit has been active throughout the Bible. Not only when you read in Acts two, folks, the Spirit, that Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, has been active in Genesis to Revelation. Amen. In our text this morning, we see a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That had been prophesied and promised in the whole Old Testament by Jesus. He had promised, made a promise. The Holy Spirit will come. And stay. Because Jesus was leaving. Jesus was there in person. He had his disciples follow him. He taught them. He trained them. And then he was going back. He said, now the Holy Spirit will come. Yeah. Yeah. And that occurred on the day of Pentecost. The events described in Acts 2 are the beginning of the church. The beginning of the church of God. Every man, woman, boy or girl in this whole wide universe who has accepted, who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior belong to that universal church. Yes. And it started on the day of Pentecost way back, more than 2,000 years ago, right in Jerusalem. The promised time when Jesus would lead his people by his, by his physical presence, but instead by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was going back. So it is important that we understand this power that is given to us. We need to understand it. Because if we do understand it, we will know that whenever we kneel down to pray, when we get up, we get to listen. Time talking is done, it's time for listening. But we expect to talk to God and to talk to God and to ask God and to ask Him, but we don't listen. We're not aware that the Holy Spirit is now at work because we have made a petition. And that's the point where we need to listen. You see, without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the church becomes like, he, like the people in Paul's day, having a form of godliness but denying the power. Yes. You see, folks, we sang this morning that the Holy Spirit gives power. Yes. You look in, in your bulletins, you have all the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go through them. The Holy Spirit comes and gives power. Yes. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 5 says, Paul says, my message and my preaching were not with wise persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. Yeah. I dare not preach without the Holy Spirit. My preaching may not be effective, will not be, will never be effective without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, the message of the gospel rests on man's wisdom. No one can come to Jesus unless the Spirit calls him. That person has to be obedient to the call of the Spirit. That, that conviction in the heart. That's when the Holy Spirit says, No, you need to get up. Your life is a mess. You need to get up. Get to the altar. Call somebody. Let them pray for you. Because you need Jesus. Yes. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. How did the Holy Spirit come? In Acts 2, we are told that the believers were together. And I really love this. 
I love this. Now there is a spirit that is going through our church in, um, these past few weeks. I love it. Because people are really coming together. People are coming together with ideas. People are working be behind the scenes during the week. People are. We are come, listen folks, it's that unity that is going to harness the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are going to make any difference in Union Park, right here, with, with, with our surroundings, we have to start with ourselves, yeah. with, our, with the unity that we need. Yeah. Without that, we can't do anything, folks. Yeah. So the Bible says, before the Holy Spirit came, they were all together. Yeah. All together, I mean unanimous. You ever been to a meeting where, where they say, okay, it has been passed unanimous. That means everybody's in agreement. Yeah. Every member of the church should be in agreement with what the purpose, the mission, and the vision of the church is. That was shown on the screen a moment ago. Making disciples, that's a vision. Everybody should have it at the fingertips. Not just as a group of people, but together in purpose and perspective. In one place means they admit or they're delighted in being in that location. Jesus said, remain in Jerusalem. Don't move. For 10 days they prayed. 10 days they were together. They were praying for 10 days before the Holy Spirit came. Can we make that sacrifice? Can we make that sacrifice for one day? Yes, they put aside everything, everything of themselves. And they came together for 10 days before the Holy Spirit came. And they prayed and they prayed. I don't know if they had any pizza delivery. I don't know whatever they had. If any subway was there, they, they had a delivery. But they prayed for 10 days and they never moved. That's where the body of Christ needs to be, folks. Oh, yes. That's where the local church needs to be. Yes. Accepting one another in grace. We may all have differences. Yes. But when it comes to the work of the Lord, we got to put those differences aside. Yes. And we got to be in unity if we need, to, need the church to move forward. Because this, the enemy has a way of, of infiltrating the unity. Yes. Because of some little disagreement or some little issue. Because... <coughs> As long as you point our head in the direction that God wants us to go, the enemy would set his roadblocks. Yes. And we got to watch out. Yes. So they were expecting something, the believers. In Jerusalem, they were expecting someone. There was an, an, expectancy, uh, an expectancy that God was going to do something in their midst. And as that day, when that day came, they heard the sound of a wind. Now when these news reporters interview people about the um, a tornado that they experience, they say, man, it sounded like a freight train. And they will give all kinds of descriptions, but a lot of times the most common thing is that the sound is like a freight train. And so the sound was coming. So first was the sound. And where did it come from? Not, not, it did not come from north, south, east, or west. It came from heaven. The Holy Spirit came from God it, like a violent wind. Yes, like a violent wind. Listen, when the Holy Spirit comes to a man, woman, boy, or girl, that wind disrupts everything and it, it takes over. Yes, sir. It takes over. I asked my brother who was in Tortola, he said, he said during the Hurricane Maria, everything was sucked out of the house. And this, the, 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 the wind was there. The wind was in the apartment and every piece of wares or utensil was sucked out of the kitchen. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He cleans all the rubbish out of our lives. Yes. All that is not of God, he takes, he takes out. Like a violent wind. And then it had a visual effect. Not only the sound, but the visual effect. What seemed like tongues of fire? Now, try to stretch your imagination here. The original Greek word gives a picture like, fire-like appearance presented itself at first. So this, this ball of fire, this, this 
global fire just came into the room. And all the apostles who were sitting around, it just divided and rested on one person. And the, the fire was there. And, it, and a part of the fire rested on another one. And then it rested another one. And then another one. Until everybody received the fire and then that cup of fire was gone. And everybody was divided. Everybody received his share of the Holy Spirit. Yes. That's it. That was powerful, folks. Yes. That was powerful. They were not themselves that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of them, I say all of them, were filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that God would fill all of us with the Holy Spirit, regardless to where we come from, what job we, we hold. All of us, folks, with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, not filled with themselves. Self does no good but with the very Spirit of God. They spoke in other tongues, other, other languages. At that day in Jerusalem, there were 14 different nations from all over the Mediterranean um, area. 14 different age, um, nations gathered in Jerusalem. So these disciples who were just now ready and equipped with the, with the, the power of the Holy Spirit by those tongues of fire that rested on them, they translated to action and they tore out of that building into the street and they fell out and they started to preach. They never went to any Bible school. And they started to preach. Amen. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in other tongues, other languages, because those 14 different nations represented 14 different languages. And so the Spirit gave them the ability to preach the gospel in the languages of those 14 different nations. And God's Spirit allowed them to speak that particular language or dialect. Verse 6 says, each one of them, of Acts 2, say each one of them heard them speak in their own language. And they asked, how can it be that, they, that, that I'm hearing the gospel in my language? I know these guys, they never been to school to learn German, they never been to school to learn Italian, but they're preaching my message. They're preaching in my language. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Yes. Yes. The Spirit accomplished what Jesus said yes. he would do in John. Listen, when God makes a promise to you, that promise, yes. that promise is true. Yes. Don't get away from it. Always hold on to it. You can hold God to it, That's and right. he will fulfill. Yes. John 14, 26 to 27, when the counselor comes, he will send you, send to you, he, he will send to you from the Father. The Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Yes. The Spirit of Truth, that's the Holy Spirit. Yes. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. The fire represents purity. What? You may ask, Pastor, why was the fire there? Why did God send the tongues of fire to rest on each of these men? It is because fire in the Bible represents purity. The fire was used, fire is used to purify precious metals. If you're going to melt gold or silver, you're going to use fire. Yeah. If, you're going to get the, if you're going to extract what is pure, you're going to use fire. You can't use anything else. You can't use acid. You can't use water. You've got to use fire, folks. Yeah. And you will get what is pure. It takes out the pollution and the impurities and leave what is genuine. Yes. Then the Holy Spirit, the fire represents presence. There was fire of the Shekinah, Shekinah glory that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. There was a fire that came from the altar to consume those who defiled the, the, the altar. In Leviticus 10 verse 1 and 2. There was the Lord speaking from the fire of the burning bush. So that Moses stated, our oh God is a con consuming fire. Yes. Those stones of fire demonstrated that God had come to his people to dwell in them and to be with them constantly from the day of Pentecost. His presence is ever near to those who know him. Amen. Once you know him, yes. you have his spirit. He abides in us. He purifies us every day because of his blood as holy people unto him. Fire is a symbol of transformation 
As long as the Holy Spirit fire touch you, you're transformed. You will never be the same. Amen. Because fire changes whatever it touches. Yes. Has God's fire touched you in, in some way? Has God's fire really touched you? And then here's another question. Why did the Holy Spirit come? Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, when the Holy Spirit came, He would give power. He would give power. Let me ask you today, how much power do you have? I'm not talking about those cars that have power that race in Daytona Beach. I'm not talking about that. My brother asked me to buy a truck for him. And he was very specific. He said, I need this truck with a certain amount of power, horsepower. We better look for that. Oh, we're not talking about that power. There's a lot of power that is going around today that we talked about in our world today. Those power right are just short-lived. They are short-lived. We are talking about the power of the Holy Spirit holds. Yes. <clears throat> that is applicable in almost any situation. Every situation. So why did the Holy Spirit come? For power. The Greek word for power is dunamis. D-U-N-A-M-I-S. Dunamis. That means explosive. Inherent power. Ready to be put to use. Yes, explosive. That's why people use dynamite. Because when you can when these guys can't get the rocks broken up with the sledgehammer, they're gonna use the dynamite because it is explosive power. That is that depicts the power of the Holy Spirit. Could you imagine that if we have a, a fraction of the power in Union Park? What explosion are we going to cause here? Yes. I'm waiting on the boat. Yes, Lord. Yes. Explosive power. Six different areas where the Holy Spirit brings power. That is written in your bulletin. So make sure to take your bulletins with you. First of all, power to witness. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Acts 1 and 8. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. In Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Wherever we go, we are to be a witness, folks. That command was given to the disciples, but it applies to us so much today that we ought to be a witness wherever we go. Man, when we, and when we drive into the yard here at Union Park, there's not much opportunity here to witness. It is out there. Right. Out there, folks. You gotta be a witness. You 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 Come to the, the, the shopping line in Walmart, you gotta be a witness. You go to the gas station to pump gas, you gotta be a witness. You report for work and, and on Monday morning, you gotta be a witness. You go uh, to walk uh, uh, around the train for some fitness, you gotta be a witness. Everywhere you go, you gotta be a witness. Yes. Yes. And the more we practice, yes. the better we'll be at it. Yes. Because you know what? We're not talking from our own head knowledge. We talk to him because we have the Holy Spirit. Yes. Make use of him. He's willing and ready. He said, yes, I will be with you. That's what Jesus said. I will be with you. So when you're, when you're afraid, when you're nervous, the Holy Spirit is there. He, he will give you the words to say. Yes. But a lot of times we get tongue-tied. We can't say anything. The Holy Spirit opens the door, opens the door for us. To say something for God. And we get tongue tied. Even members of our own family are dying in sin. We get tongue tied. We are no witness. God help us. Witness. You know who is a witness? Listen. Many, many people sit on the, on, the, on the stand before the judge. And what puts them behind bars a lot of times. The word of the witness. The word of the witness. If you have a credible witness, that person, nine times out of the ten, will be guilty. If you're a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, what you're going to bring to the table is true. Amen. The truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no mistaking about that, folks. Because one day, those very people who hear the gospel will stand before the judge. Jesus Christ, because the, the word has been given and they refused. So you got to come forward as a witness. Practice being a witness. 
It's not a hard thing to do. Just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the words. Secondly, the power to pray. Wow. And you think that if the Holy Spirit gives us the power to pray, that our prayer meeting will have more people. Thank God it's increasing. Every Wednesday the numbers get very much encouraging. Thank God for the faithful ones. Folks, the power to pray. Every week we flash on our screen a prayer list. And that's not just there to, you know, just as a form. But we supplicate before God. People, even all during the week, we supplicate before God for people who need Him, for people who need His help. We intercede for them. Whenever they can pray, we're going to help them. So the, the Spirit gives us the power to pray. Whenever our words are feeble, whenever we can't express ourselves, God looks down in the heart and He said, you know, yeah. I know where you're coming from. His Spirit said, Father, look at him, look at her. They can't even express to you what is in the heart. So let me do it for them. And the Spirit steps forward and says, Father, grant that need. Yeah. Grant that, that we... I, I, I plead before you today on behalf of our brother so and so. That's what the Spirit does. Yes. Power to pray. R. A. Tory said, if we're too busy to pray, we're too busy to receive power. Yes. Well, man, I don't want to be you. I don't want to be in that. <laughs> if we're too busy to pray, we're too busy to receive power. Thirdly, power to overcome temptation. How do you think the young Joseph got away from Potiphar's lady? It's the Spirit of God but that was in him. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can stand up under it. The Bible gives us the power, the choice to withstand temptation. Thank God for that. Amen. Fourthly, the power to strengthen the church. I love this one. Power to strengthen the church. But we're not talking about the blocks and the roof and everything. We're talking about the people. The action of the people, the response of the people, the commitment, the obedience, the responsibility. We're talking about that. How to strengthen the church. Listen to this, Acts 9 and 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria, uh, Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. By who? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. It grew in number. Wow! It grew in number. How many seats are available here for people to sit down? It grew in number. Living in the fear of the Lord. Wow! Strengthen the church. Folks, a strong church is not a church that has 500 people in it. In, in it. And show up every Sunday morning for service. A strong church is a church that leads people to Christ. Yes. And unitedly get together, regardless, it could be five people in that church. That's right. Get together and does the work of God. Amen. To the power of the Holy Spirit. Power to strengthen the church. Fifthly, power to convict and convince men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Bible says in John 16, 7 to 11, But I tell you the truth, it is for you, it is for your good that I am going away. And Jesus talking to his disciples. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world, convict the world, not me. Don't no point finger at anybody. We can't, we're not supposed to do that. Point finger at Mr. So and so and judge him. Allow the Holy Spirit to do that work. 
So many times we get in trouble because we want to play judge. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned at Satan. So all we have to do is to be obedient. And preach the gospel and allow it to do the conviction. Allow the fingers to be pointed from, God, from, from, from God's perspective, not from mine. Power to change lives. I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit didn't change my life, I don't know where, where, where I would, would have been today. I really would have, would, would have had the tag, then it's a menace, in many, many big ways. Romans 8, verse 13 to 14, for if you live, According to the sinful nature, you will die. Mm -hmm. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are? Sons. Are? Sons. Man, I'm telling you. Change lives. I'm no more Dennis. I'm the Son of God. Yes. Wow. This is just the flesh right here called Dennis Jones. The Spirit of God lives in me. Anybody who is changed from the inside has the Spirit of God living in him or her. How to change lives. A lot of people end up in bar behind bars in jails and prison because of the, they, they suffer the consequence of their misdeeds. And when they get there, they hear the power of the gospel. And their lives are changed. Changed, folks. They come out a different person. Listen, so many other people on the outside, once the Spirit of God touched their lives and they come to Jesus, they are changed. Listen, if the Spirit of God has touched your life, you, have, you must be changed. If, you have not, if your life is not changed, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Change life. One New Year's Day, in the tournament of the Tournament of the Roses parade, listen to this, a cute story. A beautiful float suddenly sputtered and quit. It was out of gas. Remember that gas story? The whole parade was held up until someone could get a can of gas. The amusing thing was that this float represented, listen to this, the Standard Oil Company <laughs> with its vast resources. But the flow goes out the gas. How ironical. Man, there are a lot of people today, they're out the gas. They are out of gas. Why? No power. No power. And if the Holy Spirit represents that power, they need that. They need the Holy Spirit. Yes. We need the Holy Spirit to always keep that tank on full. The moment it gets below a half and going down, we need to get back to God and say, "Lord, fill me. Here I am. Amen. Fill me every day, every day, folks. Your oppression, be Lord, fill me today. Because you know you're going to go places. You're going to hear things." You're going to make reactions. You're going to do actions. And that wears the tank of gas down. That wears on your power. You got to get recharged. You got to get recharged. So only the Holy Spirit can give you that, that recharge that you need. B. John R. Scott. He said, the spirit of the church. No, he said, the spirit, the church, and the world. Without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship will be inconceivable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver. No understanding without the spirit of truth. No fellowship without the unity of the spirit. No Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit. No effective witness without his power. As the body without breath is like a corpse 
So the church can will be without the spirit, it will be dead. So to make us alive, to make us look alive, to make us operate alive, the Holy Spirit must be in our lives. And this happens on an individual basis and also collective. Once the individual has taken care of the Holy Spirit and the life, the collective falls right into place. God offers us power through His Holy Spirit, folks. But we have to be ready. We have to be ready and willing to accept the power wholeheartedly. No reservations. Absolutely none. Hear these words and make them your prayer tonight and to, uh, this morning. I'm sorry. So at this moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. Because, folks, right now we, we are on the threshold of victory and we are already tasting it. Yes. Stuff is happening at Union Park. Stuff is happening among us. Stuff is happening. And we are just waiting on God because we want to be humble and obedient before Him. Yes. But we want to do what God says through His Word. We need the power of His Spirit, not our own physical strength and our own intellectual and wisdom. No, we can't do it that way. We need Union Park to shine in 2018. This is the year. Folks, we are waiting on it. Listen, before our Minister Shirella comes to read this prayer before you, and I specifically wrote it down because it really goes to the core of what we need this morning. I'm going to ask us to come to the altar. And the praise team, we're going to sing that. We're going to sing that song, Come to the Altar.